Tonight we have a very special guest with us. We've announced that you, you saw on the video announcements. Haley did a good job of announcing, but uh, we are very blessed and privileged to hear tonight from uh, Dr. Andy McIntosh. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him this morning. He shared with a group of us pastors. We had a great breakfast, and we got to spend a couple hours with him at Q&A. And you're going to discover, not only is he extremely intelligent, but he's very engaging. But more than anything, he... He loves God. There's a passion for God. There's a desire to exalt Christ. And there's, it, it just, there's a, he drips the word of God, meaning he just loves the word of God. And it's going to come through tonight. And if you're here tonight and you're a skeptic, I want to say I am so glad you're here. You're not sure about Christianity. You're still checking things out. Maybe somebody invited you. I, I am just thrilled that you're here tonight. And I pray you come with an open mind and open ears and just hear and think about the things that you're going to, to, to be taught in a moment. And if you are a believer, oh man, you're in for a treat. You are going to be encouraged in your faith. You're going to be reminded that the Bible that we believe and teach is, a, it is an absolute certain, truthful document. Not just a document. It's a living, breathing. It's the word of God that we can always count on. And you're going to be encouraged and built up in your faith. And as Haley shared with you in the video announcements, um, Andy has taught as a professor at Leeds in, in England, thermodynamics and combustion theory. He has taught the world over uh, creation with answers in Genesis, a few other different ministries. Uh, and I don't want to take any more time from him, and so I would like for him to come up now. And would you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Andy McIntosh. Right, really good to see you all tonight, and thank you very much for putting up this with this Brit, come wandering all over here. And by the way, uh, I'm the one who's come with the Queen's English, you realize, okay? You're the ones with the accent, so if you can't understand me, it's your fault, not mine, right? Something to do with the Boston Harbor incident over the other side a few years ago. But there we go, I'm going to read to you uh, Proverbs 20, verse 12, which says, The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them, right? And you might think, boy, this is a science talk tonight, but actually I want you to see that it's all part of really the Christian faith, that we should do our homework and find out the wondrous things that God has made. And you're going to be perhaps blown over and maybe stretched a bit on the science, but I want you to see that our God is so great that he makes things exquisitely and wonderfully. Another verse in the Bible says this, in Psalm 139, it says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you're, if you're going to, you know, stay with me and not go to sleep or go out for an ice cream or a whatever, you know, you might actually begin to say to yourselves, and you might, I might even hear some people say, wow, and I don't mind you doing it, because I want you to express in your heart praise to God for all that he has done. Now, the great thing that God has done, of course, is that God sent our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, and I'm fully aware of that. I became a Christian, oh, many eons ago. Yes, but it, I'm still so grateful for that day that over, when was it now, 45, no, sorry, it was 46 years ago, but it seems like yesterday when somebody asked me, Andy, are you a Christian? And I realized I wasn't. And then he explained to me, A, you need to admit that you're a sinner. B, you need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins personally. And C, you need to commit your life to Christ. And my religious scales, because I was brought up as a religious lad. Can you imagine me with a surplus on, you know, and all this stuff as a child, singing in the choir? And I'd been confirmed and had all the stuff done on me, you know. So, but I wasn't there. I didn't know the Lord Jesus. And the religious scales fell from my eyes. Those, that wonderful conversation. And the chap who led me to the Lord is still alive, and we're in communication in recent years. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful that God did that work for me. Now, that's the most important issue, all right? But nevertheless, some people who get confused by evolutionary stuff realize that, um, that they need to grasp 
that God is the creator. And sometimes people become Christians through this message. Sometimes people realize suddenly that evolution isn't true and that road blockage is removed and they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Others, it's Christian, you're, they're Christians already, but they're embracing evolution in some way and they haven't realized just how wonderful this book is that when it says that God created the world, it's true, right? So whichever state you're at tonight, and some of you perhaps already know that God created the world, I want you to see just how wonderful it is when we take God exactly as to what he said. Now, when I refer to evolution, I don't mean that you can't have small changes within creatures. I mean, after all, I've got big ears, and uh, other people have smaller ears. Some people look really charming, and others people look, to be frank, rather ugly like me. But, you know, the greatest thing in heaven, the greatest compliment will be that you haven't changed much. But I don't think it'll be said of me. You'll say, wow, he's changed a lot. And, uh, you know, we will be, have new bodies in heaven, right? But we all have variations, but we're not busy turning into another creature. Neither are other creatures like dogs turning into cats. Neither are mice turning eventually into some completely different creature with wings like bats. That does not happen, friends. So we accept that there can be some small changes, but you're not in those small changes adding information. Now, let me also say, it's not what we don't know, it's what we do know that points to design. You've heard people say, are oh, you believe in God of the gaps? That is just so untrue. Theodore von Kármán, who was a very great aerodynamicist, and uh, you won't have heard of him, but he, he's very famous in the aerodynamic world. He said, scientists study the world as it is. Engineers create the world that never has been. And he's really dwelling there on an important point, that engineers can spot design, and they often get ideas from the natural world, which is a, another point that sometimes I do develop in other talks because one of the things that I've done is to copy the Bombardier Beetle and get ideas for a new spray system. Well, I'm not going to talk to you about that tonight, but that is one of the other things that I have been involved in. And the Wright brothers over on the East Coast in 1903 copied the birds for the first time with a heavier than aircraft which could fly. And they were basically engineers seeing brilliant ideas which they could bring about for a new, in that case, an idea of an aircraft. We're going to look today at the hearing ear and the seeing eye. We're not going to look at the seeing eye, but we're going to look just at the hearing ear tonight. So I need to ask the question, what is sound? And then I'm going to say, how do we hear? And then I'm going to look at this amazing fact that there is complexity in all that God has made. What is sound when, well, you will see these pictures which will give you some idea as to what sound is. I'm not going to give you a big physics lesson, but I do just need to get this basic point over, that sound is actually compression of the air, right? I'm using sound now. In fact, I speak in the open air. I don't always need a microphone. Probably do need it in a room this big. But, you know, I speak out on the open air, and my voice, right, is making little vibrations in the air. If we took the air out of this room, well, you'd die, wouldn't you? You wouldn't be able to breathe. But <laughs> apart from that, just minor point, minor problem, you actually wouldn't be able to hear because the air is vibrating, and that's how we hear. And the sound waves go across the room into the little eardrum, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Well, it gets complicated, and I won't go too much on this line, but actually you, you, the molecules are hitting against each other, and they're passing these vibrations through the air. That's basically what that is saying there. Now, when we come to actually looking at sound, we need to remember two things. So don't be too phased by this diagram that I'm now going to put up. You get... Whoops, sorry. Here it is. Don't get too phased by this. But sound has a frequency. So don't worry too much about the stuff on the screen. Just, just listen to me and I think you'll get the idea. Sound has 
the number of times it vibrates per second, okay? So it has a frequency. So as the frequency goes up, it goes, right? Don't try and do it yourself. You might sort of hurt yourself. But, uh, you know, the, the sound goes up in frequency and all goes down, like that wonderful double bass that that fellow was playing earlier. I was, I was busy watching him doing it, and I thought, wow, that's lovely. And you, you get some great, great players, don't you, of instruments. And he was playing the bass notes on that great big double bass. And that's low notes. So that's low frequency and high frequency. And the human, he human ear... Can, human ear can hear from about 20 cycles per second, that's what the HZ means on the screen, up to, well, when you're born, you can hear right up to about 20,000 cycles per second. Did you know that when you get a bit older, like seven or eight, you're beginning to lose the top register already, right? Well, maybe 17 or 18, but it, it's... But certainly, when you get to the vaulted age of late 20s, you're certainly beginning to lose that. And when you get really old, like in your 30s, you're already... <laughs> sorry, guys, there's no hope for us, is there? But uh, certainly no hope for me. But you're already beginning to lose that top bit quite badly, right? And it's coming down to about 10,000 cycles per second. We got cat scarers in our garden at home. By the way, we call them gardens, not yards, right? You need some education in the English language. The Englishman has a garden, not a yard, right? And in our garden, we have cat scarers, which are very high frequency vibrators, because cats hear to a much higher frequency than we do. Now, my grandchildren can hear those. I can't hear them, because by the time you get to my age, and some of you, yeah, you're about my age. Uh, sorry, <laughs> you might even be slightly older. You know, <laughs> we're, 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 even, we're, we're, we're even having trouble hearing our wife across the table. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? It's true that our hearing begins to lose. And of course, it gets critical when the top register starts taking away the 4,000 cycles per second, which you'll see in a moment is very significant. OK, sound also has an amplitude. Oh, dear, that's a complicated term. What I'm saying is that not only is it this vibration, it is how much it's vibrating, right? So you could have a vibration which is very large, or you could have the same frequency, but very, very small. Are you with me? So it's the amount it vibrates. And that links with the sort of pressure changes. And uh, amazingly, the ear, when it's vibrating, it is vibrating sometimes as tiny uh, amplitudes which, to be frank, are the sort of change in pressure that you would get by me standing on a tiny little bit of book that I've put there. That sort of change in pressure, the ear can actually sense when it's vibrating that much. So the amount of pressure change is a bit like making a step on a, on a book, right? But doing that repeatedly. So the ear is very, very sensitive. In fact, when you come down in an aeroplane, as you're landing at San Diego or wherever you're landing, sometimes our ears pop, don't they? Because, you know, you're getting used to the change in pressure. And that's the sensitivity of your ears. So we just need to be aware of that. Now, the ear can hear right through this range, leading right up to, um, you know, a threshold of pain. And so those frequencies and those pressures are very big. We have a very wide range. Now, how do we hear? This is the main thing that I really want to say to you. You've got ears, and it's obviously you've got the outer part. Now, the outer ear, as I've put on the diagram there, has an ear canal, which I need to... I'm not sure whether I can point this on the screen. I'm on extended desktop. I'm not quite sure whether I can do it. 
probably I can't. I can't bring my pointer over. Oh, yes, I can. So here we are. You can see the ear canal here. This is the outer part of the ear. And of course, when you try to sometimes get things out of your ear, you can only get your little finger just right to the end bit, but you can't push it down it, which is not a bad thing, because actually you could be in danger of damaging the eardrum, which is the bit that I really want to talk to you about next, which of course is the beginning of what we call the middle ear. Then you've got the inner ear, and that's the bit which gets really interesting. So we start with the outer ear, sometimes it's called the pinna. You've got two, in case you hadn't sort of checked recently, you should have one on either side. And you get, therefore, a stereo effect. In fact, some creatures have very sophisticated ears, like owls, I don't know whether you knew, don't have symmetrical ears. Their ear on one side is here, and the other ear is slightly lower down such that they can actually pinpoint where a sound is coming from. They are masters of hearing. And the sound waves come in, obviously, in from any direction to our ears. Nobody's really quite sorted out why the ear is shaped the way it is, but it is to do with gathering the sound. There is a lot of research still going on on that. We can hear due to our hearing being on both sides of the uh, head, we can actually identify where a sound is coming from. That's due to the fact that we've got these two ears. But here comes a remarkable point. I don't know whether you knew, but there is such a thing, and I'm sorry about this sort of, this bit which might just be stretching you a bit, but have you heard of something called resonance, where an, an object has a natural frequency that it vibrates at. So it doesn't matter what it is, but a guitar that we were hearing earlier, um, that is a, probably, I shouldn't go for the electrical guitar, but a, a, a non-electrical guitar, just a standard guitar, has a sound box behind it. And that sound box will vibrate at a particular frequency. So it resonates, okay? This double bass, which I really do like. I don't think United will let me take that back on the plane, but there we go. Anyway, I would be wrong to pinch it, but it looks wonderful, doesn't it? <laughs> but it's got a wonderful sound box, and it's naturally vibrating at those low frequencies, okay? So that's the point that I'm making here. So you've got a glass bottle or a, or a glass um, cup here. That will naturally vibrate. And the Tacoma Bridge on the right is another example. In the, 1940, uh, in the 1940s, that bridge collapsed because of this natural frequency that it had, and it created a bit of a disaster. Then there's this cup here, which is vibrating at a natural frequency. If you take a flute, right, there is a natural frequency for that tube. If you change the notes that you press, you're exciting a, nat a different natural frequency depending where you press in the tube. Now, get this, the ear has a natural frequency. And when you work it out, it's a natural frequency associated with about three or four centimeters, which is it's, it's about that sort of distance that the ear canal goes in. And would you believe it that that natural frequency is 4,000 cycles per second? In other words, God has made your ear canal to resonate where human speech tends to come. Obviously, some people have very high-pitched voices, so it's more like 8,000. Some other people speak with a very low voice down here, and it's nowhere near 4,000 cycles per second. But nobody has a pure tone, and usually it's somewhere in that region of 4,000 cycles per second. So that immediately shows a design point. God has made our ear canal to vibrate at the speech frequency that most people are speaking at. Okay, you couldn't hear your wife yesterday, but that was a different problem, right? <laughs> because you probably were reading the newspaper and not bothering to listen to what she was saying. 
But uh, there you go. Um, now we come to the middle ear. Now the middle ear begins as to where that dr eardrum is vibrating. Have I lost anybody yet? Put up your hand if you're lost. You don't dare do that, do you? But anyway, you're with me. Okay. Well, if you are lost, go get a Coke and hype yourself up a bit, and you might get the rest of this. Okay. All right? So we'll, we'll see how we get on. Because now we're going to look at the, uh, the middle ear, right? You've got an eardrum which is vibrating a bit like that drum that the, the gentleman was playing earlier, the set of drums that he was playing, right? But of course, he was hitting the membrane on the drum to make it vibrate. Our eardrum vibrates due to the sound coming in. Now get this, behind the eardrum is a set of bones, which you can see here, if I can just bring this um, pointer over, there we are, you can see that there is a set of bones here. Now I'm going to look at those bones. Now we're going to start really seeing the wonder of what God has done. These bones, right, are called the ossicle bones. There are three of them. There is a dime to give you a sense of how big they are, okay? They're tiny bones. And would you believe it? These bones are exactly the same when you were born as a baby as what you are now and, sadly, when you leave this world. Those bones never grow. And yet the evolutionist says that those three little bones came from the jawbone of a reptile and that they moved gradually over millions of years and became these bones in the ear. That is seriously taught in San Diego State University and in UCSD and in many other universities right across the Western world. Now do you see why the science is pointing totally against that? Just that one point destroys any evolutionary sophistry. So these bones, right, which are called the malleus, the incus and the stapes, or sometimes called the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup, because this last one looks like the stirrup of a horse, uh, which we used for riding a horse. Uh, these bones are amazingly made to actually cause this vibration of the eardrum to increase in amplitude such that this goes a much greater distance, okay? In other words, it's an amplification method. And it's a mechanism which is absolutely essential, and you'll see why in a moment. Because those bones are causing a small amplitude of the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, which is quite large in width compared to the stirrup here, to actually be amplified because we're going into a liquid in the inner ear. Have you got it? So the, the hammer is attached to the eardrum and that hammer is pushing on the anvil and the anvil is just the right shape. It's not, they're not directly connected, they're hinged and it is then connected to a stirrup which is traveling a much larger distance because we're going into liquid. So we've had movement in air, we've got the mechanical movement of the bones and now we're going into liquid. Well, this is just stunning. And we've only just started on the bit which really <laughs> stretches our minds concerning how we hear. But I want you to follow me as best you can. This is a very old film, but it's very useful. You can see a very old electric bell there. Um, but this is now showing you the movement, okay? So here's the hammer moving. Here's the anvil. Here's the amplified stirrup pushing into the inner ear. This is full of liquid, right? This, all, this thing is full of liquid. Now, if any of you go do a bit of science, and some of you will have done a bit of physics here. Now, I know that won't be the majority of us, but just follow me. And if you don't follow me, go get your Coke and then come back again, right? Okay. But look, imagine getting a bicycle pump, right? Putting your finger over the end, 
Put up your hand if you think you'll be able to move the handle in a little bit. Put up your hand if you think that I'm right, that you can actually push the handle in. Yeah, of course you can. Come on, put up your hand. You all know that that's true, right? If you get your finger over the hole, you can push the handle in when the bicycle pump is full of air. But now, if I get the same bicycle pump, right, put the handle down, get a bucket of water, yeah, this can be fun, I know, and you pull up the syringe, as it were, and fill it with water, now you put your finger over the end, I know you've got a water pistol, we all know that you can have great fun, but, but put your finger over the end again, would you be able to push the handle in? The answer is no. And there's a very definite reason. Because whereas air is compressible, liquid is not compressible. Now, do you think the great designer has taken account of this? He has. He knew what he was doing when he made the ear. By the way, this is true of all mammals, so I need to be fair here for those who say that this evolved, which of course I don't believe for a moment, but they will say, well, you know, you could have evolved from some other mammal, but then you've still got the problem of how does a reptile ear change into a mammalian ear, okay? And that's really what I'm really looking at tonight. So I don't believe for a moment that we evolved from other mammals but I'm only looking at the ear, and it is true that all mammals have this type of hearing. Now, look, this is the stirrup going in there, right? You can see that, and perhaps I'd better show it on the big screen so that you can all see it, because I know you can't all see what I'm pointing at. So I'm going to bring the pointer over. What I'm referring to is there's the stirrup going in, right? But please notice there is another little window here or another little membrane, I should say, there. Now, that membrane is going out the other way as this one goes in. So you've got these membranes doing this. And the reason that it's happening is because that inner ear is full of liquid. If you didn't have a release mechanism for that pressure, you'd blow your inner ear to bits as soon as you heard anything. So the great designer, who, of course, is God himself, has taken account of that. And you'll see up here that we've got the words round window, which is the, which is the relief membrane because the stirrup goes against the oval window. So God has taken account of what's needed. Now we come to the amazing part of the inner ear. I just need to say one last thing about the last slide, and that's this. You notice here that there was this membrane vibrating inside. We're going to look at that. That is called the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane is this, right? I've opened up the cochlea. The cochlea is the inner ear. It's called the cochlea because it looks like a cockle shell, right? So we've opened up now the cochlea. We've unwound it so that we can see what's happening. Now, the amazing point is that when you've got one sound at a particular frequency, it causes that basilar membrane to vibrate at a specific point, right? So if it's middle C, then middle C corresponds to a particular location on the cochlear basilar membrane. If it's, if it's say, I don't know, the, the note G just above middle C, it will vibrate another little location, OK? So the amazing thing to realize is that you've got a little mini piano in there. <laughs> or think of it like a mini organ. Now, if you're a physicist here or an engineer, electrical engineer, you know that it's very, very difficult to actually analyze a sound instantaneously. You're now going to see that the Lord God has made an instant frequency analyzer which basically splits any sound into its frequency components. And if you're an electrical engineer here, you'll know that that is one of the most difficult things to do in terms of getting an instant effect. 
we're getting better at doing it, but we're still nowhere near up to the standard of the inner ear. So you've got this cochlea, right, which is full of fluid. And basically, you've got, just so that you get the idea, we've got something rather like a piano, or we could say it's like an xylophone, right? <coughs> Admit it, you've played with an xylophone. And you probably played with your kids or your grandkids recently, or maybe some of you, your great-grandkids. And you actually enjoyed, you know, bouncing around on the xylophone. Now, listen to this little video clip. Can we have the sound, please? Lost the sound. Individual parts. Let me play that again. The cochlea now uncoils, and we look at the basilar membrane, and now see what happens when we play <laughs> individual tones. Now a chord. And finally, something really complex. This is going on in your basilar membrane. Okay, so whatever it is that you're listening to, you've got basically a little keyboard in there which is vibrating according to what sound is coming in. Now, the human voice speaks at somewhere in the region of 4,000 cycles per second. But there are always, if you understand me, harmonics to any sound which usually we hear. So I'm speaking somewhere probably in the region of between 2,000 up to 4,000. I've got more of a tenor voice. So Johnny here, I think, has got more of a bass voice. And basically, we've got the capacity to recognize somebody, even on the end of a phone, immediately by their voice because of all the harmonics that go with it, right? Now, your ear has the ability to take a sound and immediately split it up into its frequencies. And that's very important for voice recognition for a child to recognize its mother from the year it's born, or from the time it's born. Very important, as you well know. It recognizes its voice, whatever it's listening to. So now I'm going to really, I, I'm sort of trying to find a way to get this amazing point over. So think of that membrane, that basilar membrane, like a keyboard. Now I'm going to show you what's going on, right? The cochlea, keyboard or xylophone effectively splits the music or the sound of the voice into its component parts. It acts like a frequency analyzer separating out the different notes like a piano on like a piano keyboard. So I've I've cheated here obviously because I wanted to convey this using this talk. But imagine I play a particular note which I'm going to now can I have the sound I'm going to play you this. Whoops. No, that didn't work. So, can we have the. Yeah. Can we have it up a bit, please? Now, this is a digital analyzer, which I'm showing you is actually analyzing a sound, right? A sound comes in, and you can make a digital analyzer to recognize a sound. I'm saying you've got a mechanical frequency analyzer which does that immediately. So, perhaps this is one of the climaxes of my talk. If you are listening to, say, some wonderful music, your ear immediately starts vibrating in your inner ear like a little orchestra. So, let's now play a fairly well-known piece, which is Dances of the Wolves. Let's play this. No, that didn't work. So your ear is causing these vibrations in your basilar membrane as you're listening to this music. Isn't that wonderful? So you've got a little orchestra in there where each individual frequency and all its harmonics are beautifully vibrating in sympathy with what you hear, whether it be this music, whether it be an orchestra, whether it be your wonderful wife's voice, or whether it be your husband's, or whether it be a, a soloist of some kind. Do you get it? 
Our air is built for beauty. Are you getting it? Acoustic beauty. So our ear is fearfully and wonderfully made, rich in its ability to appreciate voices around us, music, everything. In that sense, we are over-designed. If we were evolving, why would you need all this? It's because God wants us to appreciate actually his voice as well, which I'm coming to. See? Now, I find this really just stunned me when I began to realize what's going on. Because I work in acoustics. I did a whole career on studying acoustics and the way pressure changes flames. And actually, it can be very dangerous. You can get instabilities due to pressure waves interacting with flames. So when people tell me that this ear evolved from something like a reptile ear, which I'm coming to right at the end, I'll show you what a reptile ear looks like. I say, come on, guys. That's not real science, that's imagination. Because you don't want to believe the obvious, which this shows to every engineer that there is wonderful design features in it. Remember I had that quote from von Kármán, engineers know and recognize design. The problem is that many biologists are not talking to engineers. So just to summarize, what you've got is the sound coming here, hitting the eardrum, hitting the hammer. This is the anvil amplifying the sound. This is the stirrup, this is full of liquid. And it causes the basilar membrane to vibrate depending on what frequency is, it is at different locations. So we can hear beautiful harmonics. We can hear the sounds and we can appreciate all that God has done. Look, friends, this is really stunning. Remember I said that we can hear a number of frequencies. This is the high frequency end. This is the low frequency end. Sadly, we lose this bit, as I said, as we get older. But now comes the amazing last bit. Because we've got now mechanical vibration of the basilar membrane, but now we've got to convert what was movement mechanically of bones, which went then to movement in liquid, which then went to the mechanical vibration of the basilar membrane. We're now going to convert that movement, would you believe it, into chemical energy, which then gets translated to electrical energy. This is just stunning. If anybody knows anything about engineering, to conserve energy when you're going through so many processes is exceedingly difficult. Whereas the ear is one of the most efficient energy conversion devices that has ever been invented. There is an auditory nerve going all the way through the cochlea just underneath the basilar membrane, okay? And there is a special organ of corti which runs along the basilar membrane above it, which then translates that mechanical movement of the basilar membrane into an extraordinary movement of tiny little cilia, or hairs, which actually get pushed over to one side, and as they do, they actually, they actually pick up chemical ions I-O-N-S, which then transmits electrical energy to the auditory nerve. This is just blows your mind. To be frank, it's just, you know, this, there's no way that this could have come about by random mutations, as people try to argue. So let me just bring the pointer over if I can get it. Should be here. Oh, I've lost it. I've lost the pointer. Oh, here it is. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. These are the hairs attached to another membrane which is lying below the basilar membrane. And remember, you've got liquid in here. And when those hairs get pulled over in one direction, they ionize. I won't go into all the details of the chemistry here, but that because the fluid is full of ions, 
right? These, these become electrically charged in the, in the presence of those ions. And would you believe it, if you look carefully at my diagram, you can see that there is a little spring which connects adjacent hairs or adjacent cilia. Get this, this is so tiny that you would need the biggest microscope to actually pick up this bit. There literally is a little spring which connects those two, two adjacent hairs and brings them back to vertical again. And that came about by random mutations over billions of years? No way. No way. Go back to square one. If you think that could evolve, that is just out, that's beyond the possibilities. You could actually break those cilia if, you, if you're listening without, you know, if you're listening to a loud sound without ear defenders. So you do have to be careful with your inner ears. And you know that this liquid in the inner ear is also connected to another set of circles in the inner ear to do with balance. And it's those cilia, when they actually uh, get broken, can actually cause what's called Meniere's disease, and you, you can lose your sense of balance. So there are all sorts of things here connected in the inner ear, but worth thinking about hearing. I'm just about through, and I need to actually just round this off here. Because what I just want to just share with you then is that here's this membrane which is moving, which is below the basilar membrane, and here's the hairs moving. It sends this little electrical charge down the, down the auditory nerve, which is then connected to a signal which goes to the brain. Would you not agree with me that we have a wonderful and mighty God who has made us? The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Well, I want to round off by this point about irreducible complexity. You take one of that, those bits out that I've been talking about and you wouldn't be able to hear. Some people, sadly, who can't hear, and there may be some here who can't naturally hear, have had a cochlear implant, okay, which bypasses all that system and sends a signal immediately from a loudspeaker outside, or a microphone, I should say, outside, which then converts that to an electrical signal which is connected to the auditory nerve. But you know full well that cochlear implants have to be carefully designed to make them work. Well, it's the same with the natural ear. It's showing every evidence of being made by a, one of the most brilliant engineers, the brilliant engineer. The Lord says in John chapter 1, verse 3, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, including the wonderful mammalian ear. Irreducible complexity says that nothing works unless everything works together. And the ear is not going to work unless you've got everything working together. Unless you've got those ossicle bones working, the eardrum working, unless you've got the cochlea working, and everything's got to be working together. Now, the evolutionist says that the eardrum of a mammal evolved from a reptile. The eardrum of a reptile has one bone going straight to the inner ear. It doesn't have these ossicle bones. So the evolutionist seriously proposes that these little bones evolved from the jawbone of a reptile. That bone became this bone. That bone in the upper jaw became that bone. And the green bone well, he says it already had that green bone and it just got a bit shorter. <laughs> That's seriously what it's taught. We smile and, of course, we immediately laugh. But your kids, and maybe some of you here, 
young people are already in the situation where you've been taught that the ears of mammals evolved from the ears of reptiles. Frankly, it is scientific nonsense. It's not even scientific. It's imaginations of men put over as science. Can you see why I get a little bit passionate about it? Not just because I'm a Christian, but because I'm a scientist, and I believe in doing good science. So when I see people exposed, to be, to be frank, to pseudoscience, I am annoyed. I'm more than annoyed. I'm incensed that this is taught as science. Now, Richard Dawkins said this. You may have heard of him. The lower jaw, a single bone in mammals. The reptilian jaw is more complicated, and thereby hangs a fascinating tale that I reluctantly omitted from this book. But then he goes into a little bit of detail in this footnote. In an amazing feat of evolutionary ledger domain, the smaller bones of the reptilian jaw, what I just showed you earlier, were co-opted into the mammalian ear. Nice words, but frankly absurd. Where they constitute an exquisitely delicate bridge, that bit's correct, to transport sound from the eardrum to the inner ear. I looked at what the word ledger domain means in the dictionary. And it means sleight of hand, chicanery, conjuring, craftiness, cunning, deceit, deception, hocus pocus, I like that. <laughs> Manipulation or trickery. Now, we've got a very um, interesting guy who's really taking over from David Attenborough with all the natural history programs produced by that wonderfully neutral organization called the BBC. <laughs> I speak with tongue in cheek. <clears throat> and Brian Cox produced a Wonders of Life program recently, and this is what he said about this evolution of the ear. Listen to this. Can we have the sound up, please? Around 210 million years ago, the first mammals evolved. And unlike our friends, the reptiles here, mammals have a jaw that's made of only one bone. A reptile's jaw is made of several bones fused together. So that freed up two bones, which moved and shrank, and eventually became the malleus, the incus, and stapes. So this is the origin of those three tiny bones that are so important to mammalian hearing. If you have to resort to flick books <laughs> to prove your point, do you think there's something a little bit amiss? I suggest there is. So you see, I, OK, I know I'm getting folk to laugh, but actually, it's actually very serious. What I said yesterday is this in the debate that I had with an atheist. I said there's not just two fundamental quantities in living systems, matter and energy. There is information as well. Where does the information come from? That really is the issue. You see, you, it isn't just a matter of moving little bones about. That's bad enough. It's also a matter of organizing those bones, the ossicle bones, organizing the eardrum, organizing the basilar membrane, getting the frequencies right. All of this has got to be sorted out and organized. And that's where software comes in. I've got an Apple Mac computer here, and this is beautifully designed by guys who know what they're doing in information systems. It's also true that the people up the road in Seattle sort of know what they're doing. <laughs> but it went wrong so often that I got rid of it, you know. But information, do they call it Windows or something? Anyway, information actually needs very careful organizing. The code, whatever they're using, whether it be C++ or whatever it is these days that people use, that code right, didn't arise out of the material, did it? And neither does the message actually arise out of the code. These are things that people just haven't thought about. 
in the evolutionary worldview. They haven't got a clue as to where information comes from. Look, folk, I have been saying that the information obviously comes from the Lord himself. He is the one of whom it is said that he created all things. I had this verse up earlier, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Then I quoted this verse, I will praise thee. Should we all be praising God tonight? Amen. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Okay, I haven't been talking to you tonight primarily about redemption. But when you connect the two and you realize that the very person who formed me in the womb, who is the great creator, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he was sent to this world to bleed and to die for me on the cross. Doesn't that make it even more awesome? And doesn't the Lord Jesus Christ call us today? He does. You see, it was Michael Faraday who said this at the end of one of his lectures. And he said this in front of Queen Victoria. Uh, you don't know anything about our kings and queens, but uh, <laughs> just remind you that there are still a few about, you know, you just deal with, uh, well, we won't go there. But, uh, but, but he said this in front of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, the prince consul, uh, the consul. He said, therefore, our philosophy here, used as we would say our science, whilst it shows us these things, should lead us to think of him it's said in the old language, who hath wrought them, who hath made them, right? For it is said, and he was quoting here the, the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for it is said by an authority far above even that which these works can present, that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Can you imagine this? The greatest, or probably with Maxwell, the two greatest scientists, both English, of course, two greatest scientists of that day. Edison came along a bit later, but uh, he was good as well. But so you, you do get a look in. But, but, you know, but Faraday said this in front of a packed audience. And he was fearlessly saying that he believed in the book. Where are such people today? We need to stand up and be counted. Whatever discipline you're in, whether you're doing great art, wonderful music, like our double bass player, and, and the others, by the way, sorry, I'm just, but I was rather taken by the double bass, as you can tell. You know, whatever you're doing, give glory to God. Amen. Ecclesiastes says... Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Give glory to him. Don't let the world or yourself ever take the glory. And this evolutionary sophistry, which is what it is, it's not science. Don't let that rob God of his glory in your life. I've just one last thing to say, and Pastor will shoot me off the platform in a moment. But I want you to see that there is a spiritual lesson here. I've been talking about physical ears, but some of you haven't yet got your spiritual ears open. God's speaking to you, not audibly, but he sometimes actually is speaking to you audibly through his servants, and I'm just a poor servant at the moment, but you've got Pastor Stone here and Pastor Bailey and others who've been, who speak regularly here. And... He uses people, but he particularly uses his word. And he speaks to you tonight. And noticeably, it says in Romans 1, 18, two verses before the one I just quoted, it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, or it should in the original word be, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Let me ask you, are you suppressing the truth in your life? You're refusing to open your ears to the voice of God. I showed this last night. Years ago, there was a chap called Nietzsche who said, God is dead. We've killed him, got rid of him. Many atheists, and sadly, even many government officials increasingly today in this land, certainly in my land, are saying, we're going to get rid of God. Do you think God is not aware of this? Of course he is. He loves us. He loves these nations, even in their evil. Sadly, your nation is going the same way. Nietzsche died in about 1900. Somebody aptly said, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> God has the last word. People think that they can get rid of God, but all men die, and all men face the end. I said to my atheist friend last night, I said, look, I regard you as a person. I regard you as someone who is made in the image of God. I said to him, I respect you. You've got creative powers because he's written many books. I said, but you're arguing that you're worth nothing. You're arguing you're worth just a bunch of chemicals and that you'll rot in the grave. A friend of mine met Dawkins in Oxford High Street, just happened to meet him after an open air meeting they'd been doing. And he came up with his bike. Somebody said to him, that's Dawkins, so he went and talked with him. And he had a, quite a long conversation with him. And Dawkins got a bit irate because, you know, this person who's a Christian was trying to say to him, look, you've got a soul. And he refused to accept it. Then he said, look, you've got a brain, you're very clever, you're a good mind. And, you know, where, do, where are you going to go? He said these famous words. He said to this friend of mine, he said, my brain is just a lump of meat. In other words, he gave no value to himself. When you push God out of your thinking, you lose the definition of what it is to be human. You reduce everything just to molecules. We are made in God's image. Remember that verse that I shared with you. All the things I've been saying tonight speak of God's greatness and the wonder of what he has made. We have no excuse, friends. God holds us accountable. Now, if there's someone here who's not yet a Christian, and it's only for those who are not yet understood that Jesus Christ has loved them as their creator and died for them on the cross. I've got a lovely booklet here called The Relevance of Christianity in a Scientific Age, written by a dear friend of mine who's now gone to be with the Lord. He died in 1998 from cancer, but he was world-renowned in his field of rheumatology, knew an awful lot about medicine. And this is written so well to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a Christian, there's a lot of people here tonight. If you're not a Christian, you're welcome to take this. But look, my dear friends, I haven't got enough to give everybody who'd say, oh, I want to pass one on. <laughs> you know, I can't do, even do that. So if, I just want you to quietly come and seek me out at the front. There's lots of books, well, not lots, but there's some books at the back, which Johnny will look after for me. And there's my own book, Genesis for Today, some copies of that. If you'd like to know more on the science, come and talk to me afterwards if you've got problems. I'm here for a while. But I particularly, if there's someone here who's not yet closed with Christ, come and seek me out. Take one of these booklets. And I'll be so thrilled if you find the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour tonight. May God bless you. Oh.
your word. We thank you, Lord, for its power. Even though we've been thinking about the science, which may be as phased some people, I understand that. Lord, they nevertheless, hopefully, Lord, have grasped all of us here that there are intricacies in the way that we've been made which display your awesome power of creation. But may we most of all be just really brought to tears as to what Christ has done for us, the same person who created us, what Christ has done for us on the cross, how he bled and died that we might be forgiven. We thank you for an awesome God whom we worship. Our God truly is awesome. And we look forward to that glorious day when we shall meet Christ face to face. He will wipe away every tear and we will be with him forever. Gracious God, we thank thee for him. Amen.